Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Penn State 365 Podcast. My name is Dylan Callen Crowley. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Marty Leap and Anthony Hizan of uh, Happy Valley Insider of the Robs Network covering Penn State Athletics on the field and off the field. Today, we will be talking about Penn State's 63-7 win over the Delaware Blue Hens, a dominant performance on both sides of the ball for the Ninny Lions uh, out uh, gaining the Blue Hens in this game, 541 to 140. You'll see that and other notable stats as well as some notable scores from around the country below on our bottom ticker. But gentlemen, like like I said, a, a pretty dominant performance for Penn State on both sides of the ball today. Uh, just what's our uh, initial takeaways from this one? Obviously, an FCS opponent. It's hard to have too many concrete takeaways. Uh, but I, I think generally you saw what we really said on Wednesday that we wanted to see how the Nini lines on offense and defense. The starters took care of what they had to do. Uh, the starters got out of there within the by the second drive of the third quarter. Uh, plenty of young guys saw snaps in this game, got plenty of action in the second half. Uh, and most importantly, it looked like they stayed pretty healthy, all things considered. Uh, Marty, What's your uh, overall feelings here uh, as we start talking this one out? Yeah, you know, I said it on Twitter um, after the game. It it went exactly how you want a game like this to go. Penn State came out from the get-go, took the game by the throat, throttled them, completely dominated in every facet. Um, Nobody got hurt. Uh, You know, you played a great game. You were dom- like so you dominated everywhere. You dominated in the trenches. Drew Lar looked good. You, you couldn't have asked for a better game. It's it's hard to get much out of a game like this. And you know, I said this going in. The biggest thing you want in a game like this is to just get out of it healthy. They got out of it healthy. They got out of a fifty-six point win. And like you said, Dylan, they were able to get a lot of young guys a lot of very important uh, playing time along the way. So yeah, I think it went about as as well as you could possibly expect a game against an FCS opponent to go. A- a- absolutely, 100% agree with you there. Uh, Anthony, what's your uh, initial takeaways here? Yeah, Penn State did exactly what they had to do, and they did it in dominating fashion. The offense was damn near perfect. They didn't punt until, like, the very end of the first half, and that might have been the only punt of the game. They might have punted one more time, and that was it. So, you know, complete domination on offense. Defensively, only one play that really you can point to as anything that was, you know, bad. Everything else was, again, complete domination if you take out that one play. Like 50% of Delaware's, I think it was, I looked at, I did the math, it was like 47%, so nearly 50% yep. of Delaware's offensive yardage came on that one long touchdown. So again, just besides that, total dominance defensively. The only thing that I wish they would have had a little bit more of was some field goal opportunities, you know, maybe get Falcons and Sahadak some reps. But again, that's hard to replicate. If you can get touchdowns, you go get touchdowns. You're not going to tell your guys to stop scoring. And, you know, so that's the only thing. But other than that, it was, you know, a damn near perfect game by Penn State. Yeah, like you said, uh, 47% of Delaware's total yards in the game came on that one uh, run by Marcus Yates, 66-yard touchdown in the first quarter, which at the time made it a 14-7 game. But then the lines would never look back. Some other notable stats uh, from that outside that play, the Blue Hens totaled just 74 yard, yards of total offense, including just 18 in the first half. Uh, I, so, I mean, it really just was one play for the Nini Lions that kind of, it, it's still a great performance. It's just, it, it was the one blemish on an otherwise near perfect day. Um, Delaware averages 3.4 yards per carry in the game, but you take away that 66 yard run, that number drops down to 1.4. Uh, Nini Lions kept Delaware to two for 11 on third downs. Uh, Blue Hamps had just 58 passing yards in the game, 6 of 17. Uh, they did throw one interception, which was a pick six by Dominic DeLuca in the second half. That was a nice little uh, play for him. I think we all agree with that. A nice story that he has been for Penn State over the last few years. Penn State didn't rack up a ton of tackles in this game, just 31. But overall, I think Delaware only had uh, a little around 40 players or so. It wasn't much at all uh, but they did record I believe it was four sacks seven tackles for a loss and seven quarterback hurries uh, 
recording sacks for Jalen Reed, Jam- Jameel Lyons, Zariah Fisher, Fisher, Deny Dennis Sutton, Tony Rojas both recorded tackles for a loss. Uh, so you got to like seeing the two freshmen get involved. Lyons had a really big hit on the quarterback as well. Uh, he is a definitely a grown man. I think we're going to see a lot more of him. Tony Rojas, obviously, obviously somebody who's already been greenlit for Penn State, but I'd be shocked if we don't see more of Jameel going forward. Uh, and then you you mentioned Alex Falcons and the kickers. No field goal attempt today, but 8 for 8 on extra points. Uh, or Sorry, 9 for 9 on extra points, including Falcons going 8 for 8. Uh, so if you're Penn State, you got to definitely like that after last week. A little consistency building up there. Um, I guess since we talked about the defense, any anything that really stands out to you guys on the defensive side of the ball for Penn State today? I mean, they did get a lot of guys, uh, young guys, reps off the top of my head. King Mack was out there uh, pretty early and often. Elliot Washington was out there. Uh, we mentioned Tony Ross. We mentioned uh, Jameel Lyons. Uh, Davian Collins, not a true freshman, but a redshirt freshman from Mississippi State was out there. A lot of the young guys got a lot of snaps today. Uh, Anthony, what's your just general thoughts on the defense, I guess, that you didn't touch on just yet? And getting those young guys snaps. That's the biggest thing, yeah. There's not a whole lot you can really take away from it besides that. They were able to get a lot of guys in the game, you know, able to get a lot of young guys, especially some true freshmen in their first career, you know, snaps. And that's so important as you move through the season, especially for guys like King Mack, Elliot Washington, Zion Tracy, Jameel Lyons. You want to get those guys as many reps as you can possibly get them because that could be vital as you get into the middle to the end of the season where, you know, guys start getting more fatigued easily. You know, some injuries might occur. You want to be able to have guys get those game reps so that they feel that they can step in and make an impact once they get into Big Ten play. And I think those guys performed really, really well. Obviously, this is an FCS opponent. So there's only so much you can take away from these performances. You expect those guys to perform well at this level. But at the same time, it's an encouraging sign that they did. Also worth noting, uh, Kavion Keys was out there at one point. He recorded tackle. Makai Flowers was out there as well. And then I think we mentioned everybody else. Uh, Marty, what's your thoughts on the defense as a whole today? The young guys getting some much-needed playing time. Uh, no, no real standout guys defensively today. I mean, Abdul Carter had four, four tackles, which – uh, with Zane Duran led the team. Duran had a solid game, four tackles, a sack, and uh, uh, one and a half tackles for a loss. But uh, yeah, what's your just general thoughts on that? The young guys, all anything defensively? Um, yeah. F- first off, defensively, uh, I said on our pregame episode that if there was a young guy who I thought could uh, flash some today, getting extended reps was Jamil Lyons, and boy, did sure. he ever! Yeah. He man, he looked violent physical explosive i love it um and other than that though i, I will say i think abdul carter played a much better game than last week i think he only had what'd you say four tackles right but he was he was all over the field you were seeing him blow up plays the line you were seeing carter blow by lineman getting to the ball he was all over the place and chop robinson was very similar oh. um yep. there was a third down in the second or in the second quarter where chop robinson was past the left tackle, I think, before the mm-hmm. snap even got to the quarterback's hands, yep. and he just derailed the entire play. So it was not that you were ever worried about Carter or Chop, obviously, but after neither of them played particularly well against West Virginia, it was still good to see them bounce back games and be themselves, be disruptive, be all over the field. Um, but, yeah, other than that, I mean, shout-out Jamil Lyons. I'm going to keep beating that drum and driving that, that bandwagon for as long as I can. And like you said, Dylan, just good to see the young guys get reps and um, – valuable reps especially for some of these young guys that you know you might need at some point this year you know if you get an injury or two a corner or at linebacker or whatever it may be so yeah it was just good to get those guys reps and uh see them play well again it was delaware but you want to see them play well and they get the chance and that's what happened yeah and again it is delaware but worth knowing today after only recording i think two three and outs last week or uh two three maybe uh they forced uh, six three and outs today against Delaware. Delaware only had two drives that went beyond 10 yards. Beyond those six three and outs, Penn State also forced two turnovers uh, within the first two plays of a drive. Uh, and that, that doesn't count Delaware's uh, kneel down at the end of the first half. But uh, I think 
Uh, six for eleven. I mean, over fifty percent. That that's pretty good when it comes to three and outs. I think at the end of the day, like we said uh, at the top and on Wednesday's podcast uh, previewing the game, Penn State's defense just came out, played their game today, and, and that was all they had to do to have a dominant win. They just have, and I think we're going to talk about this a lot against most opponents this year, but Penn State's defense, I think, just has too much athleticism, size, and speed for most opponents to face on a weekly basis to to have enough plays to get into striking distance against this Penn State team, especially with how this Penn State offense is, which we'll talk about in a second. But this Penn State offense is going to score in bunches this year. We saw that last week. We saw that this week. Uh, if team... And I just don't think opposing offenses are going to be able to have enough sustained success because of the Nanny Lions, athleticism, size, all that on the defensive side of the ball uh, to really stay within striking distance of Penn State this year. Uh, any final thoughts on the defense from either of you today? Yeah, the only other comment I'll add, not necessarily defense because we keep saying it was only Delaware, it was only Delaware. Yeah. Yes, it was only Delaware, but... Go look what happened in Columbus today. I guarantee you Ohio yeah. State fans don't feel great because, oh, it was just Youngstown State. You yeah. can come out in games like this and screw around and sure. make it ugly. So it's, it's what you want to see. You want to see them come out and just throttle the inferior opponent, which is what they did. Sure, yeah. Ohio State, for those watching this on YouTube, uh, as you could probably have seen or, or have, you have seen on our bottom line, Ohio State beat Youngstown State today just 35-7. to seven. Obviously – you can't really take much away from a game against an FCS opponent, just like we can't uh, for the game today in Happy Valley. But uh, for a Ohio State team that struggled offensively last week, I didn't get to watch much of the Ohio State game this week. I'm sure that they, you know, kind of were just going through the motions. But these are the type of games we've seen in the past where Ohio State puts up 60, 70 points against FCS teams or even g5 teams uh, that, that's not been the case last week against indiana a team they should have steamrolled in, and it wasn't the case today against youngstown state either and i mean even beyond that you could go look down at clemson now the final score was uh, a blowout but clemson struggled with uh who do they play today um charleston southern charleston southern yeah, yeah. at one point clemson was losing and they only led by seven uh, late in the third quarter yeah so, I mean, it, it is uh, what it is in these FCS games. But for Penn State, they came out, they played their A game today, which I, mean, which I think is most important. They didn't take the day off. They didn't look at Delaware too lightly. They came out, played their A game. And outside one bad play, the Nittany Lions were nearly perfect on Saturday afternoon, I think it's fair to say, on both sides of the ball. Um, let's go over to the offensive side of the ball where it was equally as impressive. I mean... Drew, Drew Alar, 22 for 26, 204 passing yards, one touchdown, an 85% completion percentage. Uh, I had I had the stats typed up here earlier. Let me find it here quickly. But I believe he is now through two games, something like 36 for 49, uh, even better than that. But either way, he's he's been very good now through two games. His first two career starts for Penn State. Uh, he is, his decision-making has been impeccable. Uh, he's thrown the ball uh, accurately almost every time. Very few passes have gone, gone away from him. It's been very encouraging for Penn State to see that through these first two games. James Franklin said as much in his post-game press conference, saying it's really exciting to be able to build off these types of performances. But beyond that, Penn State's rushing attack today, 315 yards and six touchdowns across 60 rushing attempts. Catron Allen led all rushers with uh, 103 yards on 19 attempts and a touchdown. Nick Singleton with three touchdowns today, 47 yards and 12 carries. Uh, Potts had 59 yards. Trayson Potts had 59 yards and seven attempts. Uh, pretty good day for him as well. And then 10 different receivers had uh, receptions today for Penn State. It, uh, much like yesterday, there's not a lot of complaints. You sorry, yesterday. Much like last week, there's not a ton of complaints you can take away from this Penn State offensive performance. They are much better in the red zone too today, going eight for eight with eight touchdowns. Anthony, I'll start with you. Just what's your thoughts on the offense today? Yeah, I mean they they moved it well. They were able to do whatever they wanted to do, and there was very little Delaware could do to stop it. 
Um, you know, Drew put up, you know, relatively modest numbers, all things considered, very efficient, very effective for what he needed to do. He yep. didn't try to play hero ball. He took what Delaware gave him, and he let the running backs really steal the show in this one. Obviously, like you said, over 300 rushing yards on the ground. They were able to do whatever they wanted on the ground. So why would you really, you know, deviate from that? You know, big yeah. day for the lawn boys. And, you know, Drew had a nice performance as well. And like I said, it's just, just pure domination. Drew today, 43 for 52, 529 yards. Sorry, not today. Drew for the season, 43 for 52, 529 yards, four touchdowns. And he added a rushing touchdown to the ledger today as well. So did Bo Perbula, who had a nice day in relief of Al, of Drew. Uh, three for five, 22 yards, one pass and touchdown. But also, eight carries, 46 yards, and one touchdown. Marty, what do you think about the offense? What do you think about Drew, the rushing attack? But also, Bo and uh, his uh, couple series he got in that second half. Yeah, I mean, like you guys said, very efficient. It was clear that Penn State was not going to worry about chunk plays or anything of the sort in this game. Um, you know, Delaware safeties were playing deep, so that was a factor. But ultimately, they knew they didn't need to, and that was the kind of game Mike Yersich called, and they were efficient. I mean, Drew Alar just, man, uh, you're, it's two games in, and you're running out of things to say about the guy already. Um, and, you know, he had the four incompletions, and if not for a tremendous play by a Delaware linebacker to get a hand on a ball that was ticketed to Malik McLean, that would have gone for a huge gain. He probably finishes this game with only three yeah. inflations and maybe another 30 or 40 yards. So just so good. Um, but what, what was most impressive to me about the offense today, in all honesty, and this is something that's very easy to overlook and probably was overlooked, the pre-snap reads and checks by Drew Allar today, sure. especially facing a 3-3-5 defense, which is something you don't see a lot of, um, was very impressive. Second career start, facing a funky defensive front you very rarely see. Um, and multiple times he was able to make good reads, good checks pre-snap. Um, one that really stood out to me was on, I think it was Nick Singleton's first touchdown of the T formation. He checked it at the line yeah. to swing the side of the play. He originally was going to go to Allen. He checked it to Singleton when he saw the defense, and Nick walked right in. So that that's the big thing to me. You know Drew has all the physical talent in the world. The fact we're seeing the mental side of it shine through this quickly is impressive and a great sign for where this season can go. And that's for Bo Perbiola, like, I, man, I, I was sitting here watching the game with my dad, and he and I were talking about it, and we agreed Bo Perbiola could start for a lot of Power 5 teams right now. So Penn sure. State is in a great spot at quarterback. Um, Bo Perbiola is a lot of fun to watch run the ball. It reminds me so much of Trace McSorley. Just the, even the way he runs, his body language, his mannerisms look like, maybe it's because yep. he's running number nine, I don't know, but it looks so much like Trace to me. Um, he throws a good ball. Cool to see him get his first career touchdown pass today. Just, yeah, this is the, the best shape Penn State's quarterback room has been in in a long, long time. And here, here's what James Franklin had to say about uh, Drew Allard's performance today. He said he's steady Eddie. Uh, he never gets too high. He never gets too low. You can pat him on the back. You can scream at him. He's just steady Eddie. His preparation on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, obviously is a small sample size. But last year, I thought he prepared as if he was the starter, and he's taken it to another level this year doing a great job of managing the game, the clock, situational football, all those things. I've been impressed by him. Uh, and he would later go on to say, I think the biggest thing is he showed signs last year, but it was a small sample size. This training camp, as well as these first two games, there's a ton of plays to be evaluated. What you guys are now able to see, a larger amount of reps and a larger sample size, is what we saw really all training camp. It's exciting to build on. It really is. And I think that preparation that Franklin noted, noted in that quote there is paid off today and what you were talking about there, Marty, with his pre-snap reads, what he was doing at the line of scrimmage today and last week. Penn State, I mean, he, he has all the arm, arm talent in the world. He, he's a physical specimen, but he's also, you know, uh, very mentally advanced as a quarterback. This is a guy who, uh, you know, learned under Sean Clifford for a year and and for whatever anybody wants to say about Sean Clifford's, you know, uh, miscues on the field or things that he struggled with on the field. The one thing we know about Sean Clifford was there's very few people in the Lash building during his six years at Penn State who worked harder in the film room than Clifford. And I, and I think he rubbed off on Drew and Bo in a big way in that aspect. And I, I think it's paying off for Penn State with that as well and so far in this season. Um, going back to Drew there quickly, 
Uh, the four incompletions today, he had run, he had one early on on his second pass, but then he had 13 straight uh, completions throughout the first and second quarters. He had two, sorry, he had three incompletions in a row in the second quarter and then finished the game with eight straight. Just his level of consistency when he gets on these runs, he is such a dangerous passer, and I think that's what Penn State struggled with in the Sean Clifford era for a while was Clifford just never had that consistency of being able to come, you know, make not just two, three, four passes, good good passes in a row, but five, six, seven, eight, so on and so forth. Drew's shown that in these first two weeks that he can get on these hot streaks, and when he does, it's really hard to stop this Penn State passing attack. They'll have a bigger test next week against Illinois. Illinois hasn't looked great this season so far through two weeks, but that is a smart defense. Uh, so I'm excited to see how Drew can perform against a, a defense that's going to be a, a little bit of a higher caliber than West Virginia and Delaware, to say the least. Um, Anthony, what's your thoughts on this offense performance today? Drew's performance and anything else? I see. Yeah, no, just um, you know, going to your Illinois point, I, I really think this would be you know the first you know decent defense that drew is facing this season and I, sure. i'll be interested to see how he responds to it you know looking at illinois in their last couple of games i think you know their defensive line obviously is solid they have a couple of really good playmakers on that defensive yeah. line so they'll have to uh, be able to account for that and the offensive line will have to step up but i think their secondary has looked a little weak and i think that drew could exploit that so we'll see if uh, they're able to take advantage of that a little bit absolutely and go back to the game and we could briefly talk about next week in a minute here but going back to the game quickly the only other major i guess discussion point here or two going forward is um one trey potts had a really nice performance as i mentioned seven attempts 59 yards i think for the most part katron now and nick singleton are going to be the bell cows of this offense they're going to receive 95 percent of the carries but if potts can build on today's performance i i, I think we will can continue to see parts of him throughout the season especially in those bigger games where Penn State may look to run the ball maybe Singleton and Allen one of them gets a little banged up or you know just needs a little bit of a breather uh, Potts could be somebody who you know develops here into a nice little role or develops a nice little role in the offense going forward and then second of all Tyler Warren had a career day today six receptions 37 yards a touchdown Excuse me, but um, Theo Johnson got the start, just two receptions, 14 yards. He's had a slow start to the season over the first two weeks. Warren's been a little bit more uh, involved to a degree here, especially today. Well, do you guys have any thoughts on this tight end room going forward? I, I mean, I think it's a tight end room that when they get the ball, they're going to be productive. But going into Illinois and going forward, who do you think is – the real, I guess, starter of this tight end room. Is it a guy like Theo Johnson? Is it Tyler Warren? Or is it just whoever has the hot hand they're going to go with from a week-to-week -week basis? I mean, Theo Johnson started so last year, uh, had a, was a little bit banged up with an injury as well. But uh, once he got going last year, he was he, he had a pretty solid ending to his season. I wouldn't be surprised if once he gets going this year, it's similar. But Tyler Warren definitely looks like... Uh, He's got a, not, a little bit of a head start this season on Johnson. Uh, probably not the best way to describe that situation, but Warren's definitely off to a nice start. Uh, Anthony, any thoughts on the tight end uh, room or Trey Potts? No, I think, like you said, they're just going to go with the hot hand. You know, they'll both, I think, will have games where, you know, Theo Johnson goes off, and you'll have games like this one where Tyler, Tyler Warren goes off. You know, it, they're just going to, you know, whoever is in the flow of the game the best, that's who's going to get the most looks. I think it's nothing sure. really more to it than that. Uh, Marty, any thoughts on the tight end room with Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren? Any thoughts on Dre Potts? Um, the only thing I'll say on the tight end room is you said who you think the true starter is. To me, it's both. They run sure. so much 12 personnel, which we expected coming into the year. I think you can classify them both as starters. Um, I think they're both really, really good. So it's a good good position to be in. I mean, I know they haven't produced like people have thought thus far, but it's very obvious that they weren't part of the game plan against West Virginia because they didn't need to be. And same thing today, even though, you know, today they did get Warren the ball good, but as you said. Um, 
And as for Trey Potts, I mean, I'm just, I'm sure that'd be a cool moment for him today to run as well as he did at Beaver State. I mean, I know we talked yeah. about him here. He's a kid who, if he doesn't get hurt his senior year of high school, good shot he gets offered then already here. So that's, it that was cool for him. And I mean, it just goes to show the depth of this Penn State running back room because Trey Potts is a really good back who could definitely start at a power five school. And here he is playing third fiddle to two of the best backs in the country. So, uh, again, that's just a, a good position for Penn State to be in. Yeah, and you bring up both guys being the starters, and I agree. And, I mean, James Franklin also said today uh, in the post game that he, he originally was talking about the running backs and how um, basically the quote is we're going to play both of them like starter reps and their competitors. They want the ball and they want opportunities to make plays, but they also understand – the long term for their collegiate careers, but afterwards showing that those guys have a lot of tread on their tires and are fresh for their careers for the long haul. Um, he said that's the same thing they'll, they ha- have in mind for the tight end room. Uh, and, and I think that's probably a good kind of example with today. Catron Allen had the bigger day than Nick Singleton today in terms of yardage. Uh, Tyler Warren had the bigger day than Theo Johnson. But next week, if Theo Johnson goes off for 100 yards, I don't think any of us would be surprised um, so it'll be interesting to see how those two work together in that tight end room, How, who has the bigger game each week, who's the go-to guy. But I think overall Penn State's in really good hands with both those guys. Even if Theo Johnson's numbers may not be where some would expect him, I think it's going to be something like with Brennan Strange with Theo Johnson. Brennan Strange may not have had the biggest numbers last year, but because of his skill set, his physicality, all that. He went second round last year in the NFL draft, and I wouldn't be shocked if Theo Johnson has a similar uh, story at, when it's all said and done as well. Uh, are we ready to briefly talk about next week with Illinois? All right. Absolutely. Penn State next week travels to Illinois to take on the fight in Illini. The Illini are 1-1 one one on the season after losing to Kansas on Friday night. Uh, 34-23 was the final score. Illinois has not looked good the first two weeks of the season. They barely escaped Toledo 30-28 before losing yesterday. Last time these two teams met was the infamous nine overtime game in 2021. Penn State obviously has some revenge on their mind. Any quick thoughts on this game, guys? Obviously, we'll go more in depth, but I think on paper, this is a game where when this line comes out Sunday morning, I think Penn State's going to be favored by, I, I honestly would put it probably 17 points right now, if, if, if maybe more. I'll guess 15 and a half point favorites, somewhere around there. Yeah, it's as thing of 14 15. Ultimately, it's still a road conference game. As bad sure. as Illinois looked and as good as Penn State's looked, you're still going on the road for a conference game. So. But, yeah, I mean, I'll start a little bit here. Sure. Throughout the offseason, I said this Illinois game is one that scares me. It was it was a tricky spot. Um, I mean, Illinois has looked terrible this far. They shouldn't have beaten Toledo. They should be 0-2. And honestly, I, I didn't see the game last night because of just being a varsity football and sort of thing. But from everything I've read and seeing some highlights, it seems like the, that game against Kansas wasn't even as close as the final score was. Um mm-hmm. So there's no reason Penn State shouldn't come out and take care of business on Saturday. Now, that said, it's Drew Large first career road start. It's an 11 a.m. local time kick. They haven't played like it, but this is a really good front seven for Illinois. Um, Brett Bielema is what he is. Um, I, I don't expect Penn State to go to Champaign and just roll over them by any means, but I certainly feel much – not that I ever would have picked Penn State to lose this game, but I feel much more confident now than I did before. I think this can be a game where – you know, it's ugly early, but Penn State, you know, had you asked me before last weekend, I probably would say, hey, I'll pick Penn State to win this in the five to seven, ten point range. Sure. Right now, I think they can win this thing by two plus scores, even if it's ugly for a while and they're able to just start pulling away. But still, it's a big test. It's, it's again, conference game on the road, first road test for Alar. Um a really, really good front seven even hasn't played like an 11 a.m. local kick. There's a there's a lot of variables here to where, where this game could be more challenging than you think. Absolutely. Uh, this Illinois defense through two games has allowed 955 yards, including 539 yards to Kansas last night. Offensively, 
715 yards over two games, uh, 374 against Toledo, 341 against Kansas. Go back defense, I should note, Toledo had 416 total yards of offense in that game as well. So this Illinois defense, which was the big reason that they were uh, a very competitive team last year, just has not been the same without Ryan Walters calling that defense for the Illini. Uh, so that'll be something to watch next week, especially with this Penn State offense that through two weeks is looking like one of the better offenses in the Big Ten uh, and perhaps the entire country. Anthony, what's just your early initial thoughts on Penn State, Illinois, now that we've seen both teams for two weeks? Yeah, the biggest thing that I'm going to be looking to see is how Penn State's able to handle the offensive game plan Illinois is going to have, which is obviously going to be to run the ball early and often. If we saw any weakness in this Penn State defense, it's that they are susceptible to giving up longer runs. And I think, you know, Bielema saw it in 2021 when they won that nine overtime game that you can run the ball on this team. I think that's still the MO of this defense, and he's going to try to exploit that. So how is Manny Diaz going to scheme against that? But overall, I agree with both you and Marty. I, I don't see, you know, I, I think Penn State should win this game by at least 10 to 14 points. You know, I'll be interested to see where that line comes out at. And, sure. you know, it, it, it'll be a tough test for Penn State regardless of how Illinois is played. You know, you're still 11 a.m. kick. You know, that they're going to be – Illinois is going to be ready for this game. You know, regardless of how those first two games have went, they, they're going to be up for a top-10 opponent. They're going to come in hyped up. Their fans are going to be hyped up. They're, they're going to be ready to go. Penn State needs to be ready to go as well. But talent-wise and the way the first two games have gone, Penn State should be able to take care of business. But, you know, we'll see what happens. And, and notably with uh, the Illini, Luke Altmaier, their quarterback, some may not think of him as a dual-threat quarterback, and we'll see how he does against his Penn State defense. But through two games, he has 139 rushing yards, had 69 against Toledo, 70 against Kansas, averaging 6.3 yards per carry. This is a Penn State defense that had some trouble with West Virginia's uh, starting quarterback, um, blanking on his first name, but Green, um, in week one, who is a dual threat quarterback. So it'll be interesting to see what Illinois takes from West Virginia's game plan in week one, what West Virginia succeeded with in game one, and uses it against Penn State next week. And I'm sure uh, the Navy Lions are going to emphasize his dual threat capabilities in this game. Um, where it is worth noting that this Illinois offense does not have star running back Chase Brown anymore. He's off to the NFL. Uh, but Reggie Love the third uh, has been solid so far this year. 20 carries, 108 yards, averaging 5.4 yards per carry. The big... The big player for Illinois offense so far this year has been wide receiver Isaiah Williams, who has 11 receptions for 150 yards, coming off an 82 reception, 715-yard season last year. Um, so just a few early names to know. Uh, but it will definitely be intriguing to see how that Illinois front seven, like Marty has talked about, that was expected to be pretty solid coming this year, plays next week after you know struggling the last two weeks against uh, Toledo and Kansas. Uh, a defense as a whole, but on the ground, Kansas had 262 rushing yards last night. Toledo had 186. Penn State's been able to sh show that they are willing to run the ball this year, even if they're not getting huge chunk plays. They've been very methodical about it, so that'll be something to watch as well. But we'll talk about this game and much more later this week when we preview Penn State versus Illinois. But anything else from you guys before we wrap this one up? All right. Well, with that, we'll end this podcast for today as we uh, finish recapping Penn State. 63-7 win over the Delaware Blue Hens. The Nittany Lions dominate on both sides of the ball, leaving uh, you know little doubt of how good they can be this year when you know clicking on all cylinders. We'll see if they can carry this win over into next week when they face a struggling Illinois team. But until then... Everybody, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Enjoy the first Sunday of NFL football. And we'll talk to you guys next Wednesday or Thursday to preview Penn State versus Illinois. Until then, have a good one.